All right, what's up, Woodstock students? How you guys doing tonight? Doing good, man. I've uh, thank you all for coming out here. I know it's getting late in the school year, and you've got exams and you've got stuff to wrap up. But man, isn't it great to come here and worship Jesus together? Man, I love on that last song, Oceans, that last verse, I could just hear all of you singing out, and it was so awesome to hear. So thank you guys for worshiping Jesus and giving him the glory that he deserves. Well, tonight, if you've got your Bible, we're continuing in Kingdom Come, and we're looking at 1 Samuel 17. So if you've got a Bible, go ahead and turn there tonight, or uh, flip there in your phone, or whatever it is you need to do. And we're going to look at 1 Samuel chapter 17. It's a familiar story tonight. But we're going to look at it in a way that may be a little unfamiliar to you. Now, I need to know tonight, i got a little poll question to start us off. I need to know how many of you guys have ridden a roller coaster before? How many of you guys have ridden a roller coaster? Okay, it's most everybody. How many of y'all, how many of y'all um, are scared of roller coasters? They put a little fear into you. How many of you have ever been scared of riding a roller coaster? Okay, most of us, okay, even if you're here and you're like, Man, I'm hardcore. I'm all in. I'm riding that ride. I'm not even, not even afraid. Most of us, at least at some point, before we got on that first ride, were probably a little bit scared of roller coasters. And some roller coasters are scarier than others. One of the scariest in the world is the fastest roller coaster on planet Earth. Does anybody know what the fastest roller coaster is? What do you think? No. What do you think? No. Let's put it up on the screen. Do we have that one? Go ahead and put it up there. Maybe we have it. We got a roll. There it is. It is the Formula Rosa roller coaster. It's, uh, it, you can ride it at Ferrari World, and uh, it goes to 150 miles per hour in five seconds. Some of y'all are like, that's faster than my parents' minivan. Yes, yes it is. Just a little bit. All right. Maybe not, maybe not on a really steep hill. I don't know. But it's fast. It is similar to aircraft carrier catapults. And to ride it, you're supposed to wear safety glasses. So that's how fast it is. Now, if you're like, Brian, where can I ride that? It's, it's really not that far away. It's in Abu Dhabi in the United Arab Emirates. The Middle East. So good luck with that. All right. But if speed doesn't scare you, maybe height scares you. The tallest roller coaster in the world is this roller coaster. The King to Ka. It's, uh, if you could get a, a glimpse of just how tall, you can see the, the cart right there on the top left hand. You can just imagine how tall it is. It is, it is 456 feet tall. And you can ride that one at Six Flags Great Adventure and in New Jersey. Right? I mean, you got to put something fun like this in New Jersey, because if you live in New Jersey, I mean, come on, you need, some, you need some help. All right, how about this? I'm just kidding, I love New Jersey. Not really. Um, but one of my favorite parts of roller coasters, see if you can track with me on this, is the loop. Like, I love the way my stomach sinks down into my toes on a drop, but I love a loop where you just go up and, and over like this. The tallest vertical loop on a roller coaster in the world is 160 feet tall and there it is that is the ride full throttle at six flags in california 160 foot tall vertical loop i mean if that doesn't bring your lunch back to visit you i don't know what will right now how about this okay some of you are like okay loops are cool but drops now, we've seen the tallest, but did you know there is a steeper roller coaster? It's actually this one, the Takabisha. <laughs> You're like, you do this. Yes. It's, it's like negative. It's, yeah. Like, look at that. That is nuts. It is a 121-foot drop. It's the Takabisha. You can ride it in Japan at the Fujiku, Fujiku Highland theme park. So you got to go to Japan for that one. But, boy... That's pretty scary. Now, you guys, we've, we've all ridden some pretty cool roller coasters, but I remember where it all started for me. See, I love a good roller coaster. I'll admit, sometimes when they're, they're really big, like the ones we've seen, they make me a little bit nervous. But the very first roller coaster I ever rode was Big Thunder Mountain Railroad at Walt Disney World. Anybody else with me? Okay, there it is. 
not quite the King Dakar, all right? But when I rode that thing, I was an elementary kid. And, and as an elementary kid, I loved going to Disney World because I liked the rides. They were my speed. You could ride on the Jungle Cruise, which is like a boat ride with little robot snakes. Or you could ride Pirates of the Caribbean, another little boat ride. And I loved those kinds of rides. I didn't want to touch Big Thunder Mountain Railroad. But one day my parents said, Brian, we are riding Big Thunder Mountain Railroad. And so they dragged me and my brother into the line. And the whole way through the line, we are pleading with our parents, saying, please don't make us ride this. Please let us get off. I think my brother was like in tears, begging, get off, you know, let us get off. This is child abuse. We're calling child services. You know, we're going to die. I mean, look at us. We're, we're, we're like eight years old. We're going to slip right out of the bars and get run over by the, the train. It's not going to be good, mom and dad. But they persisted. We got on board the train car, the bar came down, and that voice came over the speakers and said, get ready for the wildest ride in the wilderness. And at that moment when that train took off, my laugh, my life, not my laugh, my life flashed before my eyes. And because I was like eight years old, it was really short, and it consisted mainly of Transformers and Ninja Turtles. And I said, I've got to survive because my life has not been very exciting up to this point. And of course, we rode the ride, we got off, and we're like, that wasn't so bad, right? It, it scared the life out of us, but at the end of the day, it was perfectly safe. And that's what's interesting about roller coasters. They, they scare us. They feel like we're, we're, we're taking this big, courageous leap of faith, like we're putting ourselves out there to get on something like the King Ka or the Formula Rosa or something like that. But in reality, is there any risk to getting on a roller coaster? No, because here's what I guarantee you. I don't care whether it's the fastest or the tallest, everybody that gets on, gets off. And everybody that gets on, gets off. Listen, everybody from, from the sixth grader who's finally tall enough to ride, can I get an amen? amen? All right. To the 80-year-old grandpa that's got his pants jacked up so I just got to pull down his zipper to see out. Everybody gets off or else lawsuit, park closed down. Okay? Now, it feels like a risk, but it really isn't that big of a risk. And, and in our lives, guys, even though we may feel bold and courageous and like we're risk takers, we live in a very safe and sanitized world. I mean, it is hard to really put your life and everything you've got on the line for something. And I, I think it means that most of us don't know what it would truly be like to risk everything, to truly take a leap of faith, to truly step out for something that mattered. And here's my challenge for us tonight. What would happen if we put as much faith in God as we put in a roller coaster? Because you think about it, you're putting your life in the hands of that thing. When that safety bar comes down, if that safety bar goes up, right, we're done. Are we willing to take an even greater risk, put our lives in the hands of God, and see what he will do? Is God worth your faith? Is his glory worth your faith? Is who he is and what he has done, his gospel, worth your life? That's what I want you to think about as we look at 1 Samuel chapter 17. So here's where we zone in, we focus, we're going to study the scriptures together. Remember, you guys can handle science and algebra, you can handle the word of God. So let's go to town. No, we're not going to talk about math, don't worry, Josh. All right, here we go. Shh, listen up. 1 Samuel 17. The first thing I want you to see tonight is when it comes to... Stepping out and living for Christ, the odds are not in our favor. Take a look at verse 17. Now the Philistines gathered their armies for battle. And they were gathered at Soka, which belongs to Judah, and encamped between Soka and Azekah in Ephestimim. I love Old Testament names. And Saul and the men of Israel were gathered and encamped in the valley of Elah and drew up in the line of battle against the Philistines. And the Philistines stood on the mountain on the one side, and Israel stood on the mountain on the other side, with a valley between them. And there came out from the camp of the Philistines a champion named Goliath of Gath, whose height was six cubits in a span. He had a helmet of bronze on his head, and he was armed with a coat of mail. And the weight of the coat was 5,000 shekels of bronze. And he had bronze armor on his legs and a javelin of bronze slung between his shoulders. The shaft of his spear was like a weaver's beam, and his spear's head weighed 600 shekels of iron, and his shield bearer went before him. So the Philistines have come out to fight because they want to regain control of Judah. They want to reassert the fact that Judah serves them. They don't serve Judah. And so they come out to battle. And on one mountain are the Philistines and their army. On the other mountain 
are the Israelites led by King Saul and their army, and there's a valley between them. And out into the valley comes Goliath, a Philistine of Gath, and this champion strikes fear into the hearts of the Israelite army. His height is six cubits in a span. If you translate that to today's measurements, that means he is nine foot nine inches tall. Right? Somebody tell the Atlanta Hawks. We got to draft that guy, right? I mean, nine feet, nine inches tall. He's huge. Imagine that in hand to hand combat. This is before guns and grenades, right? So if you fight a guy, you're fighting him with swords. And if a guy is nine foot nine inches tall, I guarantee his arm is a little longer than yours. So you're swinging your sword, and he just swings his and cuts your head off before you get within 10 feet. I mean, the guy's got long arms. Not only that, the weight of his armor is 5,000 shekels. That's 125 pounds of armor. That is a lot. Of, that's, that's more than a lot of you weigh here tonight, okay? He is wearing like one of you and then some, Right? I'm looking at some of you guys here on the front row, right? I mean, that's, that's pretty heavy, right? 125 pounds. And so he is massive. His head of his spear weighed 600 shekels. That's 15 pounds. And his spear is like a weaver's beam. What that means is if he throws this at you, he is going to split your insides wide open. You start with one liver, you have two livers. After this guy stabs you. He is terrifying. And here's Goliath's challenge to Israel. Listen to this. Listen to this. Here's what he says. Verse 8, he stood and shouted to the ranks of Israel, Why have you come out to draw up for battle? Am I not a Philistine, and are you not servants of Saul? Choose a man for yourselves and let him come down to me. If he is able to fight with me and kill me, then we will be your servants. But if I prevail against him and kill him, then you shall be our servants and serve us. And the Philistine said this, listen, I defy the ranks of Israel this day. Give me a man that we may fight together. When Saul and all Israel heard these words of the Philistine, they were dismayed and greatly afraid. Goliath basically says, I'm bigger, I'm stronger, and you are going to serve me. And even the greatest warrior that Israel had, Saul, the Bible tells us Saul was more handsome and taller than anybody else in the land, yet even he is terrified at the voice and the challenge of Goliath. And listen, what our world will say, it may not be a nine foot tall Philistine, but what our world will say to you, you tonight who claim to be a Christ follower, our world will say, I'm bigger, I'm stronger, and you will serve me, not your God. That's what the world will say. Now, sometimes this comes out in big ways. I was reading a book recently about when the communists took over East Germany. After World War II was over, the Russia came in, the communists came in and took over East Germany. If you know anything about the communists, they were atheists. They were not a fan of religion, Christianity, or churches. And when they took over East Germany, they targeted religious groups. So here's one way that it happened. The Free German Youth, which is a communist government organization, stay with me on this, organized meetings in high schools, high schools, where some of you are headed here in a few months, to uncover and dismiss hostile elements from the premises, which mainly meant Christians. So here's what they did. School tribunals made up of teachers and students interrogated students suspected of religious leanings. These were huge public occasions. Students who refused to join the free German youth or who insisted on going to church were named, condemned, and expelled one by one, on stage in front of their whole school. Many of them left the stage crying. Can you imagine that? In your school, if a tribunal was held, the whole school was gathered, and you were brought up, and they said either quit going to church or you're expelled from school. And you'll have no job, you'll have no way to make money, and everybody will know that you are opposed to the government. This really happened to thousands of teenagers. And the world may not do this to you. I hope. Our country is changing in some ways. It may come to this someday. But right now, you're not going to face this. But the world is still saying something similar to you. I'm bigger, I'm stronger, and you will serve me. The world has all the governments. The world has more money, more people, more power, more media, more schools. You say, I'm going to serve Jesus. And the world says, oh yeah? Wait till you see all my movies and television and music I'm going to send your way. We'll see who you're serving after you consume that hour on hour on hour. See, I've got better entertainment. 
you will serve me. The odds are not in our favor, just as they were not in Israel's favor to serve God and not the Philistines. But there's good news. Yes, the odds are not in our favor, but good news, God is on our side. Let's take a look at the very next verse, verse 12. Now David was the son of an Ephrathite of Bethlehem in Judah named Jesse, who had eight sons. In the days of Saul, the man was already old and advanced in years. The three oldest sons of Jesse had followed Saul to the battle. And the names of his three sons who went to the battle were Eliab the firstborn, and next to him Abinadab and the third Shammah. David was the youngest. The three eldest followed Saul. But David went back and forth from Saul to feed his father's sheep at Bethlehem. For 40 days, the Philistines came forward and took his stand morning and evening. So introduce our hero. He's not who you would expect. He's the youngest son of Jesse. And more than that, he's so non-essential to the battle that he just goes home to feed his father's sheep. In the meantime, the guy is taking care of sheep, making trips back and forth to the battle. The youngest son, the last guy that you would expect. And why is he the hero? And I'll tell you why I think this is. God doesn't go to call a bigger, stronger man than Goliath. That's what we would expect. Instead, he calls a weaker one. One who's feeding sheep. One who's much younger. One who's the youngest of his father's son. One who's so unimportant to the battle, he's going back and forth. And this reminds us of something. When God wants to do something, he usually looks for something weaker to accomplish his purposes. See, when we think about good overcoming evil, we always think about good getting stronger until good is strong enough to lay a whoop down on evil. Right? That's what we think of. Like, okay, for instance, the Transformers. Right? When Optimus Prime is getting beat up, what does he do? He goes and recruits the Dinobots. Bigger, badder Transformers, so that now good is stronger. When the Avengers are getting beat up, what do they do? In the new movie, they re go recruit. I'm not going to spoil anything. They go and recruit more Avengers. There's no spoiler, John. It's okay. It's okay. I wouldn't do that to you. But that's the point. They get bigger, they get stronger until they can eventually overcome evil. Or when, for instance, um, don't worry, I'm not going to spoil anything else. Or when, for instance, Baymax goes to fight the man in the kabuki mask. Okay? He's not strong enough. So you've got to form the big hero six so now that good is strong enough to overcome the man in the kabuki mask. The point is this, and every time we think about good overcoming evil, we imagine good becoming stronger. But that's not the way God works. God goes for the weaker person. God goes for the unexpected person. Because God loves to overcome evil. God loves to overcome strength with weakness. Because it shows just how powerful our God is. Listen, anybody can overcome evil if they're stronger than evil. But only our God can overcome evil through weakness. And so God chooses David. And David's a great choice. Why? Because David has confidence in God based on, his, on the truth about God and his experience. Look with me at the text. We're going to flip down here a couple verses to verse 24. All the men of Israel, when they saw the man, Goliath, fled from him and were much afraid. And the men of Israel said, Have you seen this man who has come up? Surely he has come up to defy Israel. And the king will enrich the man who kills him with great riches and will give him his daughter and make his father's house free in Israel. And David said to the men who stood by him, What shall be done for the man who kills this Philistine and takes away the reproach from Israel? For who is this uncircumcised Philistine that he should defy the armies of the living God? And the people answered him in the same way. So shall it be done to the man who kills him. God, uh, David says, I know God. Who could defy our God? And then these words that David says are reported to Saul. Verse 31. When the words that David spoke were heard, they repeated them before Saul, and he sent for him. And David said to Saul, let no man's heart fail because of him. Your servant will go and fight with this Philistine. David's like, I got this. I got him. It's no big deal. And here's, listen to King Saul's response. And Saul said to David, You are not able to go against this Philistine to fight with him, for you are but a youth, and he has been a man of war from his youth. He says, This is a big, bad dude. You're still a kid. You don't have the experience. You can't win. And here's what David says, verse 34. But David said to Saul, Your servant used to keep sheep for his father. When there came a lion or a bear and took a lamb from the flock, I went after him and struck him and delivered it out of his mouth. 
And if he rose against me, I caught him by his beard and struck him and killed him. Your servant has struck down both lions and bears, and this uncircumcised Philistine shall be like one of them. For he has defied the armies of the living God. David says, I've had experience. I've killed lions. I've killed bears. I can handle this big dude. But then, why does David think he can handle this dude? It's not because David is like, Psh, look at me, man. Lion killer. Bear. I mean, like, I wrestled a bear to the ground. Like, if, if, if that's you, if you've done that, respect. Instant respect. That's what David has done. But that's not why David thinks he can kill Goliath. Listen. Don't miss this. This is key to understanding the story of David and Goliath. Here is why David is sure he can win. Look at the next verse. This is in verse um, 37. And David said, The Lord who delivered me from the paw of the lion and from the paw of the bear will deliver me from the hand of this Philistine. It was God. It was the Lord's power that let me overcome the bear, overcome the lion. And because I know the Lord, and I believe the Lord, and I trust the Lord, and have confidence in the Lord, I know I can beat this guy. See, David has great confidence because he knows God is on his side. He knows the Lord, and the armies of the living God cannot be defied as long as they are the armies of the living God. Because this is the God that overcomes strength with weakness. Let me ask you a question tonight. Do you know this God is true? Not have you been in church? Did you go to VBS? Did you go to Awana? Did you grow up here? You go to Christian club this morning or tomorrow or Friday? I'm asking, do you know that this God is for real? And have you experienced it? See, I'll be honest with you. When I sat where you sat, I didn't know that. I grew up in church. I went to Awana. It was great. I enjoyed growing up in church. I enjoyed the Bible stories. But I didn't really have any confidence that this God was for real. I got involved in church in middle school because in, in, in middle school, about seventh grade, something happened to me that happens to all of us in middle school. Right, guys? There's a point at which, as a guy, you know, girls have cooties. They're the enemy. Stay away from me, girls. And there's a point at which you suddenly wake up one morning and you're like, you know what? Those girls are all right. I think I'd like one of those, right? And, and girls, that, that happens to you the opposite way at some point. And that happened to me in middle school. And the truth of the matter was the girls at middle school were nice. The girls at church in middle school were nicer than the girls at my school. So I thought, oh, I like girls. There's girls at church. I'll go to church. I was very spiritual as a seventh grader. About as spiritual as some of you. Amen, right? Okay, you tracking with me? It's not necessarily a good thing. Just, just a warning there before you're like, yep, me too. Um, so that got me through middle school. Then I hit high school, and all my best friends go to church with me. So I loved going to church in high school because my friends were there, because we did lots of fun things, and because I had these wonderful feelings. We would all get together and worship God. That's all my faith was, friends, fun, and feeling. I had no real confidence in God until I went to college. And when I went to college, through the influence of several classes and things that I took, I really began to question and doubt the existence of God. I went through a period where I stopped believing in God, and I made a decision. I've got to decide if this God is for real. So I read the Bible. I read all the books that I could get. I spent as much time in prayer as I could. And it was that moment in my life in college where I finally realized this God is for real. He's true. I've experienced it, and he is worth my life. Look, I can look at some of you tonight and tell you've not been there. Some of you maybe have. I believe with all of my heart that a 6th grader, 7th grader, 8th grader can come to the unshakable conviction that this God is for real. Because we see it happening in the scriptures. I've seen it happen in, in, in places I've been. My question for you is, do you know this God is true? Have you experienced it? Are you willing to stake your life on it? David was. He says, I know this God. I know what he can do. Do you? Are you just here playing games filling a seat. I'm glad you're here. I hope you keep filling the seat until you get an answer to that question, but I want you to think about it tonight. So David realizes that God is on his side. Even though the odds are not in his favor, God is on his side. But the next thing I want you to see is that God's hero can save us. Yes, the odds are against us, but God is on our side and God's hero can save. Let's take a look at the very next verse, verse 41. A little bit further down there, verse 41. And the Philistine moved forward 
and came near to David. So David goes out. He's got his five smooth stones. He's got his sling. He comes out on the battlefield. Goliath is there. We pick it up, verse 41. And the Philistine moved forward and came near to David with his shield bare in front of him. And when the Philistine looked and saw David, he disdained him, for he was but a youth, ruddy and handsome in appearance. And the Philistine said to David, Am I a dog that you come at me with sticks? And the Philistine cursed David by his God. Goliath looks at David and says, there's no way. Like, Goliath's expecting their biggest, baddest warrior, and he gets David, right? And, and David's not necessarily the most scrawny dude, but compared to a nine-foot-nine nine guy with 125 pounds of armor, here comes David with no armor. He's young, and he doesn't look like he's got a chance. And so Goliath mocks him. Why? Because ultimately, Goliath has a very small view of the God of Israel. He thinks that the God of Israel cannot save but through strength. Just like the Philistine gods. He doesn't believe that this, this God of Israel is so powerful that he can save through weakness. But here's what Goliath didn't know. And here's what we often forget. The God that we serve, the weakness of our God is greater than all the strength of men. The weakness of our God is greater than all the strength that this world has. And his strength, his weakness is mighty to save. That's why we read. Let's go a little further. We're getting down to the point of the passage. Verse 44, the Philistines said to David, come to me and I will give your flesh to the birds of the air and to the beasts of the field. Then David said to the Philistine, you come to me with a sword and with a spear and with a javelin, but I come to you in the name of the Lord of hosts, the God of the armies of Israel, whom you have defied. This day the Lord will deliver you into my hand, and I will strike you down and cut off your head. And I will give the dead bodies of the host of the Philistines this day to the birds of the air and to the wild beasts of the earth. That's a pretty good comeback, right? I'm going to cut off your head, and I'm going to open up a buffet for all the animals. All right? That's pretty good. You should try that if somebody threatens you at school. Maybe not. Um, but that's what he responds. Now, here's the key, though. Okay? One thing you know about the Bible, everything is in the Bible for a reason. Okay? Stick with me on this. This is, this is important stuff. Everything is in the Bible for the reason. The story of David and Goliath is included for a reason. And David is about to tell us why the battle between David and Goliath happened, why God allowed it to happen the way that it did, and why he included it for us. Are you ready? Here David's going to tell us. Verse 46. I'll read it again because it's just a cool verse. This day the Lord will deliver you into my hand and I will strike you down and cut off your head and I will give the dead bodies of the host to the Philistines this day to the birds of the air and to the wild beasts of the earth. And here's why. That all the earth may know that there is a God in Israel and that all this assembly may know that the Lord saves not with sword and spear. David says, I'm going to triumph over you today so the whole world will know that this is the true God and that this God is mighty to save. That's why the story is here. That's why the battle happened. It's missional. That the nations would see and know who the true God is and that this God's weakness is strong enough to save. That's pretty amazing. And through the weakness of David, God's going to triumph over the Philistines. And through the weakness, catch this, students. This is where it's headed. Through the weakness of one man dying on the cross, God is going to save the world. You see, this is a cool story of God's weakness overcoming man's strength. There's an even better story. It's called the gospel. Where the weakness of God, catch this, the weakness of God, Jesus dying on the cross, hands and feet pierced, unable to pull himself down. That weakness has saved us. And all the nations will know and see and praise. We serve a greater king than King David. We have King Jesus whose weakness upon the cross has saved us. Because that's the God we serve. In fact, there's a beautiful picture of this in Revelation chapter 5, where all of history is headed someday. Here's the end scenes of history that John gives us a glimpse into. And here's what he says in verse 6. 
of Revelation chapter 5. And between the throne and the four living creatures and among the elders, I saw a lamb standing as though it had been slain. There, at the end of history, the weakness of God through a lamb. A lamb is not a mighty animal, y'all. Nobody is afraid of a lamb. If you are, counseling for you. That's weird, okay? They're fluffy, they're cute. A lamb standing as though it has been slain. This is Jesus. And here's where it all goes in verse 9. And they sang a new song. All of heaven sang a new song. And here's what they sang. Worthy are you to take the scroll and to open its seals, for you were slain, and by your blood you ransomed people for God from every tribe and language and people and nation, and you have made them a kingdom and priests to our God, and they shall reign on the earth. Through the weakness of, weakness of King David, fighting against Goliath, God let the world know that he was the true God and that he could save. And through the weakness of Jesus on the cross, God has let the whole world know that he is the true God and that he can save. And at the end of the time, here's what's going to happen. In verse 11, Then I looked, and I heard around the throne the living creatures and the elders, and the voice of many angels, numbering myriads of myriads and thousands of thousands, saying with a loud voice, Worthy is the Lamb who was slain to receive power and wealth and wisdom and might and honor and glory and blessing. And I heard every creature in heaven and on earth and under the earth and in the sea and all that is in them saying, to him who sits onto the throne and to the Lamb, be blessing and honor and glory and might forever and ever. That's where history is headed. That through the weakness of the cross, Jesus would be crowned king and all the nations would bow down and worship. David says, I'm going to kill you today so the nations know that our God can save and that he's the true God. And of course, that's what we see happening. Back in 1 Samuel 17, here's how it all ends. Verse 48, when the Philistine arose and came and drew near to meet David, David ran quickly toward the battle line to meet the Philistine. And David put his hand in his bag and took out a stone and slung it and struck the Philistine on the forehead. The stone sunk into his forehead and he fell on his face to the ground. So David prevailed over the Philistine with a sling and a stone and struck the Philistine and killed him. There was no sword in the hand of David. Then David ran and stood over the Philistine and took his sword and drew it out of its sheath and killed him and cut off his head with it. When the Philistines saw that their champion was dead, they fled. God's King David wins the fight by God's power against Goliath. And Jesus, God's ultimate king, has won the fight against sin, death, Satan, and hell. And just as David cut off Goliath's head with David's own, with Goliath's own sword, so Jesus has defeated death by using death itself in the cross. Wow. That's the power and strength of our God, students. Now, we've seen, first of all, first thing we saw tonight, the odds are against us. Second thing we saw is this, God is on our side. Third thing, God's hero is able to save. Last thing, we, his people, share in the victory. Here's how it all ends, okay? We saw the Philistines fleeing, verse 51, and then verse 52, and the men of Israel and Judah rose with a shout and pursued the Philistines as far as Gath and the gates of Ekron. So that the wounded Philistines fell on the way from Sherem, as far as Gath and Ekron. And the people of Israel came back from chasing the Philistines, and they plundered their camp. All the people, when they realize, our God is the true God, our God is the powerful God, they all like, we ain't scared no more. And they go running onto the field, they chase the Philistines down, they strike them dead, they plunder their camp. It's awesome. And they all join in the victory of their champion, David. And the same way, we join in the victory of our champion, Jesus. We don't have to fear anymore whatever the world throws at us. There's nothing we can face that should shut us down. Why? Because we've seen the power and glory of our God in the cross and in his resurrection. So we can now join in that victory. Our God is stronger than anything we can face in the world. I mean, you believe that? I know we sing it. I know we talk about it. Some of y'all are facing some stuff. Some of y'all are facing opposition. Some of you are struggling to live as believers in Jesus. Some of you are dealing with difficult situations at home or in school. Do you believe that your God is stronger? Do you believe that your God is greater, that he is bigger than whatever this world could throw at you? Because if you do, nothing can touch you. Not even death itself. Do you believe that? Do you believe your God is mightier? Are you willing to put your life in his hands and risk your life for him? We're willing to risk our life with a roller coaster 
and trust that safety harness, how much more should we be willing to give our lives to the God who is bigger and stronger than anything we could face? He's bigger and stronger than the rejection you might face from your friends if you decide to live for Jesus. He's bigger and stronger than the struggles you're going through in your family. He's bigger and stronger than the temptations you face and the sin you're struggling with. We reminded that our God is bigger, that our God is stronger, and that through the cross of Jesus Christ and his resurrection, he is mighty to save. But are we willing to join in his victory? Are we willing to join in his victory and go running after him to proclaim this God to the nations? That's what the story of David and Goliath is about. The nations hearing about the God who's mighty to save. That's what the cross ultimately leads to. Us proclaiming the goodness of the God who's mighty to save. I'll share with you as we close the story of one man who was willing to do just that. His name was John Patton. And John Patton was called by God to the New Hebrides Islands. The New Hebrides Islands were discovered in 1606. The very first Christian missionaries to land on the New Hebrides Islands were John Williams and James Harris. In 1839, upon going to shore on the island of Aromanga, they were immediately attacked, killed, and eaten by the cannibals on the island. How about that for a mission trip? Right? I mean, like, you, you thought, you know, it was tough in Arizona. It was hot. I had to sleep in a room with a bunch of smelly people. This guy snores. Right? That, that's sure, that's not, that doesn't look so bad uh, uh, compared to being killed and eaten. Right? That's what happened to these guys. But John feels like, God's calling me there. And so he decided to sail for the New Hebrides Islands of Tana with his wife Mary in 1858 at the age of 33, only one year older than me. Many people tried to convince him not to go. One member of his church, a man named Mr. Dixon, said to him, The cannibals! You will be eaten by the cannibals! Imagine including that in your support letter. I might be eaten by cannibals, at which point stop sending support, right? Okay? Maybe barbecue sauce. You know, the, that would make me think twice. But here's how Patton responded to Mr. Dixon. He said this, Mr. Dixon, you are advanced in years now, and your own prospect is soon to be laid in the grave. They are to be eaten by worms. I confess to you that if I can but live and die serving and honoring the Lord Jesus, it will make no difference to me whether I am eaten by cannibals or by worms. And in the great day, my resurrection body will arise as fair as yours in the likeness of our risen Redeemer. And with that, he decided to sail for the new Hebrides Island. He says, if I can live for Jesus, it doesn't matter whether I'm eaten by people or eaten by worms, I'm going. Now, five months after arriving on the island, his wife Mary gave birth to a baby boy. He wrote in his journal, our island exile is thrilled with joy. But then he went on to write, but the greatest sorrow was treading hard upon the heels of that great joy. Less than a month later, his wife Mary died of sickness that she caught while on the island. And his son died a few weeks after that. He dug their graves with his hands next to the house that he had built. And he had to sleep over the graves to make sure the cannibals would not dig them up. He fought through countless illnesses. He was in constant threat from the natives who would surround his house, ambush him, and threaten him. They blamed him for a disease epidemic on the island. And he had to hide in trees for hours as hundreds of angry natives hunted him down. But John persevered. He continued to share Christ because he believed that his God was bigger, his God was stronger, and they needed to hear about him. He stuck it out, and many people, including some of the chiefs on the island, came to know Jesus Christ. After his experience, he wrote this about all that he went through, and I want you to hear it tonight because this is what it means to trust in your God like David. Step out. Believe that our God is stronger because we've seen the cross. Here's what he says. Yet and, Pat and persevered and so much they hadn't come to Christ. Here's what he said. Oh, that the pleasure-seeking men and women of the world could only taste and feel the real joy of those who know and love the true God. He says, oh, that the people of the world, the people who think that life is found in video games or relationship or in money or in popularity, if only those people could see and know the true joy of knowing Jesus. This guy who lost everything for Jesus. Then he goes on and keeps going. A heritage which the world cannot give to them, but which the poorest and humblest 
followers of Jesus inherit and enjoy. Then he says this, my heart often says within itself, when? When will men's eyes at home be opened? When will the rich and the learned renounce their shallow frivolities and go to live amongst the poor, the ignorant, the outcast, and the lost, and write their eternal fame on the souls by them blessed and brought to the Savior? He says, when will people stop piddling their lives away on stuff that doesn't matter and live for something worthwhile? Step out and take a risk like King David and trust in the God who saves. Then he says this, and I close with this. Those who have tasted this highest joy. His wife dead, his son dead, diseases, attacks, ambushed. He says those who have tasted the highest joy will never ask again, is life worth living? All around you every day at school, people are asking, is life worth living? They're miserable. They're searching for life in all kinds of places that don't satisfy. And here's a guy that put it all on the line for God who says, this is the highest joy. I never have to ask if life is worth living because I know the true God who's mighty to save. What about you? Do you know this God whose weakness at the cross has overcome sin, death, Satan, and hell? Are you willing to risk your life for this God, to put your life in his hands and say, take it and use it so that all follow him in his victory parade, that all the world, from my middle school to my home to the nations, may know that there is a true God. And he has the power to save because he saved me. Can you say that tonight? I pray you can. Let's pray right now. Heads bowed, eyes closed. Father, I come to you tonight and I plead on behalf of all of us in this crowd, beginning with myself. God, tonight may we be willing to trust you in the salvation you have brought us. That a picture of which we see in David and Goliath. And are we willing to, tr to follow after you and declare this victory to all the world? To stand in this victory no matter what we face in this life and to experience the great joy of knowing you. With heads bowed and eyes closed, here's my first question tonight. God has overcome sin and death in the cross through Jesus Christ. We get a picture of that at David's victory, but here's my question. Do you believe it? Has it changed your life? Have you experienced his salvation? Tonight, if you would say, Brian, I've never done that. I've never trusted in the cross. I've never taken a hold of that victory that I have in Jesus. I've never put my faith in him. I haven't believed that he's true, but I want to start believing that tonight for the first time. I just want you to slip up your hand where you are tonight. You say, I want to believe in and follow after this Jesus for the first time tonight. Trust in his salvation. Second thing tonight. Second thing tonight. You're here tonight, you're a Christian, but you've not been following in this victory that King Jesus has secured for us. You haven't been living for him. You haven't put your life in his hands. You're not declaring to the world, this is the true God and this is the God who saves. It's not real in your life. And tonight you want to begin to make it real. Say, God, I don't have that confidence in you like David had. I haven't, I haven't been living in light of the victory that you achieved on the cross. And tonight I want to start doing that. In just a moment, as we worship together, I want to invite you to come down front to kneel here and pray. You can kneel in your seat. You can lift up your hands and sing as we worship together. But I want to invite you to take this time to respond and say, God, my life is your life. Take it and use it. Help me to trust you. Help me to proclaim Jesus. That all the nations may know that there is a God and that he saves because he saved me. So, Father, I pray that as we get ready to worship right now, do a work in our hearts and our lives. Help us to come back to the God who saves, 
through weakness because he is so mighty and so glorious. I pray to Jesus' name, amen.